On behalf of the Salt Lake Chamber, welcome everyone to our District 1 Candidate Forum. This is the second in the series, and if you're looking for details on what we have upcoming, we'll be covering all of the major races in the state this year. And you can find the details on our website at saltlakechamber.com. My name is Jonathan Hafen, and I serve as co-chair of the Policy Committee for the Chamber. I'm joined today by Ginger Chen, who will be the co-host. Uh, of this forum, and she is the Vice President of Public Policy and Government Affairs for the Chamber. We are streaming live today from the Chamber offices. Thanks, Jonathan. So today we'll be talking about um, issues that are important to our business community, and we're talking with Congressional District 1. And each candidate will have 30 minutes to answer a set of questions. And Rick, just be warned, this is lightning round. We, we go pretty quickly. And we are so excited today to visit with uh, Rick Jones, a resident of Weber County. Rick, thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned, we're excited to hear from you today. Will you take just a moment to tell us a little bit about you and which area covers uh, Congressional District 1? Okay. Well, I grew up in Michigan, but my parents had lived, and my forebears had lived in Utah since the 1860s or so. And um, anyway, I, uh, I've lived in Utah since 1977, and uh, formerly I lived in Hooper. Today it's called West Haven, but I haven't ever changed my location. Um, and... I actually developed an interest in politics in high school, um, studying Supreme Court decisions. And uh, I think I really hate injustices. And uh, I feel like the court at that time uh, corrected a number of injustices that had prevailed from the beginning of our country. Um, anyway, um, my area today covers basically from the northern Utah border into the avenues, and it's pretty convoluted, so I'm not going to describe it <laughs> very much. But I want to thank the chamber for this opportunity. Um, a student of history will know that it was actually commerce that was the impetus in creating our nation and creating the Constitution. And that initially the Constitution uh, was driven by Alexander Hamilton and some others wanting to have more uniform laws between the states and uh, having a number of economic policies. And so states uh, retained their ability to quite often deny fundamental human rights, but uh, they did lose a lot of economic power in the creation of the Constitution. So anyway, I want to thank the chamber. Thank you. You want to jump into questions, Jonathan? I'm, I'm ready if you're okay. ready. So <laughs> here we go. And this goes right to what you just mentioned. Commerce, the Constitution, the economy, our system, inflation. Uh, we are dealing with inflation. It's on everybody's mind right now. The Fed's trying to combat it with uh, increasing interest rates. Mm -hmm. We're just curious to hear what your view is on how we can best combat inflation beyond simply uh, cheering on the Fed to do the right thing. Yeah. <clears throat> well, uh, we know a lot more about inflation than I believe we did in the 70s uh, when their inflation was actually twice as bad as it is today. Um, there was a common idea put forth at the time that the inflation was being caused by huge government deficits. And uh, this idea became shattered after Ronald Reagan assumed the presidency because the uh, Carter administration's deficits averaged $54.5 billion 
over each of the four years that he was in. Uh, Reagan's averaged 210.6 over the eight years that he was in. So Reagan's were about four times as big, and yet there was no inflation. And then we've also had huge deficits from President Obama and the two Bushes, and we didn't really have inflation. And so um, we have to dispel a myth that our deficits are necessarily, or I mean our inflation is necessarily caused by our deficits uh, because uh, it's not really supported by history. Now, um, what's really brought on this inflation has been a lot of disruptions in the supply chain caused by COVID. And uh, of course, COVID killed a million of Americans and then there's between maybe four and five million others that uh, still struggle with long COVID and still are not back to, to normal. And today where we have very long supply chains, and you can imagine how short supply chains were in the 1800s or earlier eras, um, with the long supply chain, there's a lot more opportunities for there to be a, a breakage in that supply chain. Um, most of this, inflation caused today, I believe, uh, is just caused by a, a lack of supplies. There's a couple of things we can do that would increase our supplies. Um, one would be, uh, we could allow in well-trained immigrants and that so we don't have the shortage of labor that we have. And um, then another thing that would be to uh, take away some of the tariffs that were imposed in um, 2018. And a tariff is really a tax, and so that's going to increase the cost of goods. Another thing that will be helpful is if uh, the United States can reduce its medical costs. I remember reading a quarter century ago how uh, Toyota wanted to build a new plant in the in this hemisphere, and they had very strong suitors from Michigan, Ohio, Alabama, quite a number of states. In the end, they did not even choose the United States. They went to Ontario, and the thing that drove that decision was our high medical costs here, because they were spending more on medical health care than they were on steel. And so it just made sense that they would go elsewhere and uh, have a nation where the medical costs uh, did not reflect the excessive prices and the wild inefficiencies of our system. Um, another th important element of reducing inflation then would be to lower energy costs. And I'm happy the government has just uh, adopted some plans that will add more uh, solar and other elements like that to the mix because that can all be very helpful. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Rick. You talked a little bit about immigration and right now we are seeing crazy unemployment that we've never seen before. In fact, there's job openings everywhere that's impacting every industry. What policy do you think would help uh, with our workforce issues that we are currently facing right now? Yeah, well, this is kind of an unusual problem to have. It wasn't that long ago that the key problem was we had six and a half applicants for every single job that was available. Um, so now we have this problem and uh, we have to realize that in a lot of ways it costs more to work than ever. I, spoke several years ago with a young man in California who had quit a job and his father was infuriated that he had quit the job. But uh, he told me that by the time he paid for his transportation and all of the other costs and uh, sometimes there's childcare involved and everything, then going to work can be a very expensive proposition. Um, one thing that could be done uh, is if we 
allow in uh, well-trained and, and qualified immigrants that have the skills that we need. And uh, that could be a, one way at least to overcome this, this problem. So. Thank you. Thanks, well, let's stick with workforce. Uh, student loan forgiveness, I'm sure you've uh, heard about the uh, announcement by our president about forgiveness of up to $20,000 in student loan debt for eligible individuals. So the question is, do you think that that's sound policy? Is that a wise way to try to encourage folks to attend college and strengthen our workforce? Well, I don't think that was the intention to encourage people. Um, I think it's a very messy situation as virtually all debt forgiveness has been. And debt forgiveness actually goes back to Mesopotamia a couple thousand years before Christ. Uh, it was found on the Rosetta Stone uh, about 200 years before Christ. Uh, Leviticus 25 uh, talks about a jubilee year and debt forgiveness. And then it also appears um, at the founding of our country, um, the states had taken on enormous debt to pay for the cost of the American Revolution. And uh, some of the states had paid off their debts, some had not. And Alexander Hamilton said, well, why don't we just have the national government pay all of the debts? Well, that was very disturbing to those states that thought, well, hey, we already paid our debt. You know, this isn't fair to us. And so it is a, a messy uh, situation. and. Um, and I'm sure you can find elements of injustice in it, but on balance, I think uh, it will help us move forward and rather than spending the resources to often track down debts that in some cases cannot be repaid. Of course, debts that can't be repaid won't be repaid. Um, it's sometimes better to just move on and look to the future. Thank you. We're going to switch gears just a little bit and talk about energy. So as we know, Utah is home to a lot of essential minerals such as lithium, copper, cobalt, and the International Energy Administration predicts that the demand for these um, rare earth minerals are going to go up and go up and go up. Um, how can um, federal policies help Utah emerge as a leader in these uh, and the producer of these minerals? Well, I think there needs to be a close partnership between the federal government and the states. And I've been often surprised by just how long it takes to adjudicate and adjudge uh, some of these questions. You know, a, a business might apply and get an answer three years later <laughs> or something like that. So um, I'm sure there's ways of doing a better job of streamlining the the process of making decisions and we we do have to keep in mind the environment but um, we have to make the the times involved uh, when businesses ask for uh, certain concessions and and that to to not be excessive great all right next topic this is a, this is a big one this is growth Utah is growing very quickly. There are good things about that, but we've also seen a lot of challenges as a state. So what is your view on how Utah can best handle the challenges that come with growth? Well, we're fortunate to live in a state that attracts many others and has been one of the fastest growing states. I believe the number one thing with growth is that you have to have planning precede growth. If growth precedes planning, then you often end up with a real mess. And uh, I've been in Cairo, Egypt, and that's an example to me of maybe not how to, to grow <laughs> because I have to believe there was not a lot of planning that went in to some of the decisions that were made there. and. Um, also, when I was there, I remember I was cautioned to never use tap water uh, for drinking or anything that would, any instance where it would go into your mouth. And, um, and then I remember seeing parts of the Nile and it was loaded with plastic bottles. And um, 
so we have to have planning, and I think the uh, there probably would be some role for the federal government, although it primarily would occur at the state level, but um, definitely uh, the history shows numerous examples where things were not planned and uh, you, you had some real problems and adjustments to make later down the road because they were not planned. Uh, for example, uh, if you study the history of European railroads, uh, you find that if you wanted to go from point A to Z, you might have to take 26 trains because uh, each of the trains had a different gauge of tracks and stuff. So you do have to have planning and uh, that's been understood by our leaders uh, for a very long time. Uh, there was a time in the 1860s where the Republican Party was a very, very progressive party and it took the lead in promoting railroads and land-grant colleges and uh, quite a number of things. So anyway, planning is the key. Thank you. So piggybacking on growth just a little bit, um, Utah and much of the West, we continue to have a hard time with affordable and attainable housing. And that impacts our workforce as our workers are the backbone of our country. What can be done um, to bring housing back into reality for the working class? Many think that housing is a local issue, but what can be done from the federal issue from a congressional seat? Well, I think there can be uh, various loans and in some cases grants and so forth. Um, it is primarily a local issue, but uh, the national government uh, has played a role in getting people into houses, uh, certainly right after World War II, and it played a very uh, big role in a number of ways. And so I do think the national government has some role to, to play and uh, we need to look at what was done in the past and uh, just be sure we're not adhering too close to the every man for himself philosophy, but uh, have some programs and that to help those that are not able to get into housing. Um, I uh, spoke with a forest service worker and he was saying how in Jackson Hole, um, they had a handful of Forest Service workers and of course, none of those workers could afford a nice place in Jackson Hole. So the government actually ended up building uh, places for them and uh, taking that approach. So anyway. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. You talked a minute ago about planning. And uh, so I wanna talk about energy with you for just a minute. We need reliable and affordable energy sources. So if you're looking toward the future, trying to plan for what's ahead, what are the sources of energy that you think we should be investing in? Well, I would put renewables at the top of the list, but I think we have to have the whole array and uh, you know, a complete phase out. We'll definitely have to take time and um, we have to look at the costs uh, of this, but um, definitely I, I think it's a wise move that the national government is uh, pushing renewables and things such as solar energy and so forth. Awesome, thank you. So it's becoming increasingly imperative for individuals to have access to broadband. And in Utah, we're really fortunate. We have great broadband. We have some gaps in our rural areas, in particular Daggett County and San Juan. There's, there's some holes where there's no access to broadband. Um, how can we ensure our rural communities are connected? And from a federal perspective, what do you think can be done? I think that we have to make a, something of a priority. Um, in the 1950s, uh, Republican President Dwight Eisenhower made it a 
priority to make an interstate highway system, included roads such as I-15. And uh, much of the basis for that was a matter of uh, national defense. Uh, he had been a military, the Supreme Allied Commander in World War II, and uh, he understood the importance of having roads and alternative ways of, of getting around. Another event happened in the 1950s. Um, on October 4th, 1957, the Soviet Union got Sputnik into space and uh, they, they beat us into space even though we had often been saying they couldn't make their nuts fit their bolts. And um, that was a real shock and at that point the national government came in and took a bigger role in education because at that point in time uh, there were high schools that were not even offering a chemistry class and so forth. And so the national government got much more involved in education. And there were some that at the time thought that Sputnik was a hoax and it didn't really happen because they did not like to see the country go down a road of greater federal involvement in education. But um, I think we can all be grateful that they did. And I think at some point we can all, we'll all be grateful if the government, the federal government prioritizes prioritizes getting broadband to everyone. Yeah, great, I agree, thank you. Okay, next question is infrastructure. That's the framework through which we grow. You've talked again about planning, talked about the interstate highway system. Uh, I wanna ask you your views on funding infrastructure. What's the best way that we can fund our infrastructure to facilitate the growth without being an undue burden on anyone? Yes. Um, well, I've seen a number of examples of where we've spent money on various military uh, items and where the military themselves didn't even want the items, but we spent the money because they were located in states that had jobs dependent on, on the states making the, the military items. And so I think we could probably look at the military budget and find uh, some of the areas where the military does not want uh, various items and uh, cut those. Um, we probably will just have to, in the end though, invest enough. Fortunately, our history shows that our country can borrow like none other and, uh, <laughs> and that, so. Anyway, I think uh, going that route uh, will minimize the, the burdens of it. Great, thank you. So we're emerging as an um, innovative leader in healthcare in life science research, so R&D in life sciences, and that's really important. And we've always been entrepreneurial and innovative state. How can the federal government support this ongoing success and what does that look like? Well. Again, funding is involved, but uh, the national government is putting out a lot of funding. Uh, one thing, though, that uh, struck me uh, a couple of years ago, uh, KUED showed a documentary called Cuba's Cancer Hope, and it actually showed Americans going to Cuba to get help with their cancer. And it said how Cuba had tried to partner with the US and uh, some medical facilities and uh, because of their status that had been turned away. And so I think uh, if we can have more partnerships with other places around the, the world that are working with this and more communication, we all, would all be benefited from it in the long run. Uh, cancer is something that uh, has touched my family, my wife is a cancer su survivor, and, um, and she's had two sisters uh, die from cancer, so I fully support any effort that will prioritize finding cures for that um, in any way possible. Thanks, we've got one more question for you. Okay. And uh, this would be for somebody that has never met you before, they know you're running for office, 
and they meet you in an elevator coming up to the 23rd floor of this building where the Salt Lake Chamber's offices are. What's your elevator pitch if they say, Rick, why should I vote for you? Uh, we just passed Labor Day. Uh, four years ago on Labor Day, I spent the day passing out literature that would promote an independent commission redistricting Utah. That proposal passed, but then it was disregarded by the legislature. And I've been very concerned by the growing divergence between the government and the American people. And uh, we have to understand that unless we have voter equality, then we will just have elections without representation. And um, I mentioned the 1960s, um, there were instances there in the state of Alabama, Reynolds versus Sims, 1964, that a vote from one area was worth 41 votes from another area. We're not doing that now, gratefully, but um, we still have presidents that can be uh, chosen in effect by 17% of the population. Um, if you look closely at the coup plan of January 6th, what it wanted to do was say some of the states didn't have enough electors or their electors were misjudged, so those states would be discounted. It would be then decided by 26 states representing 17% of the population. And to me, that's not, not an acceptable way to choose the most important leader in the world. So I believe in voter equality and um, our ideals, our Declaration of Independence says that, that governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. I think we should never stray from that. Thank you. Thanks so much, and thanks for your time today. It's been fascinating hearing from you. Yeah, thanks, Rick. We really appreciate your time and, and sharing your, your interest in running for Congress, and uh, we look forward to visiting with you more. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Congressman Moore, thank you so much for being here today. Really look forward to uh, posing a few questions to you about uh, some important topics. It's going to be rapid fire. We're, we'll skip around, try to cover as much as we can in 30 minutes. Uh, I know you're already now experienced. You're running as an incumbent, I think, for the first time. So uh, if you had a voter that didn't know you and said, hey, can you just introduce yourself to me and, and tell me why you're running for re-election, what would you say? Yeah, thank you. Um, and there is, there's lots to talk about. So I think we can fill, I think we can easily fill 30 minutes. Uh, Congressman Blake Moore. I, I was 39 when I decided to, to run for Congress. I worked for a, 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 you know, actually a Salt Lake Chamber member in Cicero Group. Um, I was working as a, as a consultant. It was a great, great career because I got to work in the public, private, nonprofit sectors. And yeah. like this key focal point to helping companies find a, you know, a better path forward or looking at what their strategy is and how they go about getting to that point, creating the data that they need to be able to make the right decisions. And oftentimes, you know, when you run for Congress, people always ask, have you, have you ever been in an elected position before? And I, you know, I say no, and I'm really glad to be able to take both my private sector experience. And plus I had, I had federal level experience in, in the intelligence in the community as well. And and uh, those two key pieces of my background have been just really, really vital as I navigate a very, you know, if you've seen the news in the last 18 months, it's been a quite a tumultuous <laughs> time um, in Congress and in Washington. Um, but I've, I've found a way to be productive. And what I tell folks at my town halls is 
I believe you elected me to go back there and be productive. And I have to find ways to come up with solutions that benefit as many people as possible. There's things that I'm going to oppose. And there's been a lot of that over the last 18 months. And then there's also things like the fact that I'm uh, in office right now as one of the you know, successfully passed more legislation into law than pretty much every other freshman Republican like in the minority. That's a hard thing to do, um, but it's because I'm, I'm working hard to be productive. And um, that's why I love the, the, the chamber and, our Sol and the, the Salt Lake Chamber we're at the event with today, but every chamber of commerce that I work with throughout the state, I absolutely love interacting with them. They're coming out, a group of them are coming out next week. We always prioritize time with them. Um, so much of what we do policy-wise affects what they are trying to accomplish in our communities, and I want to be somebody that can support them. So. Yeah, and we appreciate your willingness to meet with our group. Of course. We're really excited. Yeah, I'm excited at, at the DC, it's always a highlight for Always productive members. conversations, and, and people always want to you know, talk about the issues that actually affect individual Americans and our communities. And speaking of the issues, let's start let's with inflation. In. Talked about tumultuous times over the last uh, year and a half or so. Inflation's top of mind for everybody. We know the Fed's uh, raising rates, trying to combat it that way. What, do, what else can we do from a policy standpoint to try to combat inflation? Yeah, when I decided to run for Congress, it was, it was under 2%. Yeah. Now we're over 9%. Record inflation, haven't seen it in 40 plus years. Yeah. Um, this is something that regardless of whatever political party you affiliate with, every American is feeling this. Um, and, it is, and it's creating something where individuals that have never been involved and that, that don't really care about politics are like, whoa, what decisions are being made that are now impacting me every single month? When you have 9% inflation and you can take a look at it, your salary, if you break it down into 12 months, that's only 8.4%. This essentially at 9% takes away and removes an entire month of your salary. If you want to like, you know, the, the interesting ways sure. to look at it. Um, so you mentioned interest rates. What do you do about it? That's obviously one of the levers that you can pull. Um, but the thing that's exacerbating this more than anything, and then if we don't get control over this and we don't see an end in sight to what takes place with inflation, that's our energy policy, right? And to put it the most plainly as possible, people are frustrated that a loaf of bread costs more or eggs cost more than they had before. Well, what it takes to deliver that product to the store, your local grocer, is gone up two to three X just in a short amount of time. And so energy policy and making sure that we don't put the, the decisions made in Washington with respect to how we approach energy, that is going on the backs of every American. That is increasing costs dramatically. So it's not just about, yeah, I, I'm frustrated that my Costco bill costs more. Oh, I'm frustrated about my gas prices. Well, the gas prices are also creating so much into the inflationary measures that we're seeing. And so we have to get that under control. I'm thrilled. A lot of the work that we've been doing on the Natural Resources Committee, um, I've, got, I've got a specific bill as a group of six that we want to be, we're promoting, we're pushing to just get things, you know, into a sensible approach that should not be contentious, All right? This bill that I have, it, it sets a requirement that as soon as the environmental review is complete on an oil and gas lease or permit, then you have to grant it within 30 days. That's reasonable. I'm not saying we don't do an environmental review. In fact, I'm thrilled about the environmental process. You can look back over the last couple decades, and even in the Obama and Trump administration, we've reduced emissions. We've done things correctly on the energy world, and to go away from that only weakens us. And so I've got, you know, key legislation that we are pushing forward to make sure that we can, you know, not slow play sort of some of these delay tactics, what we're seeing in the permitting and leasing process to, to, to get things back under, under some semblance of, of, of uh, clarity. And I'll just say this in, in closing, when, you know, a leader of an organization, a CEO or anything, what they want more than anything is, is consistency. And when things change so much in Washington, it is hard for them to plan 10, 15 years out like you do when you're a CEO. You have to do that. And when, when things are changing so much and costs are going up so rapidly, it's impossible to, to create the type of successful outlook for your company. Hey, thanks so much. Ginger. Yeah. Well, and speaking of uh, challenges for companies, let's talk about workforce right now and unemployment. We are seeing unprecedented levels of unemployment to the point where there's two workers are two jobs for every worker yeah. that's looking for work. And that's it. That's crazy. So this is a unique set of challenges for businesses. Um, what can be done during this from a policy perspective? Yeah, love, love the question. Um, I'll just reiterate that 
it's whenever I go and inter interact or meet with a leadership team from any company in, in the first district or across Utah, it's, it's, it's their number one challenge is filling open jobs. Um, you saw this take place um, from the COVID from the COVID pandemic. The first thing that we can't do as a as a government is to create so much competition with the private sector on hiring and jobs. And I'm not talking about going into a government job versus a private sector. I'm talking about policies that keep people from working, policies that incentivize not working, right? They may have been well intended, but you know, unemployment insurance, when it wasn't needed and we overreacted with so much of the uh, stimulus for, for COVID, kept our workforce down and we've struggled to get that back. You saw what's called the great resignation. Individuals thought, well, it's actually, you know, this is an easier path for me to take this route. There was a legislative effort to try to create a minimum wage. And, you know, it shouldn't be the same in every single community across the country, but they wanted the standard. Well, you can, as a government, you can, you know, create, you know, you don't have to actually pass that bill. What you can do is incentivize people not to work per se, and then that's automatically going to force wages to go up, prices go up. It all adds into the first question of inflation. Mm -hmm. um, so creating, making sure that we don't do that type of overreaction in, in our federal policy is key because we should not have companies competing in that way um, with, with uh, you know, a suppressed workforce. It's been one of the key issues with um, a lot of our supply chain issues and all that. Um, the two other things that I would add, um, one thing I'm really proud of and gives me a lot of confidence to, 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 to discuss immigration is the, the compact on immigrant, the Utah compact on immigration that I know that the, the, the chamber has led out on that, mm -hmm. clearly communicating a broad, strong approach to how important it is to have some of this workforce. And that, and that often gets left out of the conversation. And, and you see a lot of things go on, um, political parties arguing about this all the time. There's no question we need to enforce good policy to keep, to keep um, cartel activity down at the border. And that's, that's running rampant right now. We do need border protections. And I love how the compact talks about that, but it also communicates how important it is to our industry to embrace that type of immigrant workforce. And um, that will help alleviate some of this if we can, if we can get our act together back in Congress and actually um, you know, create the type of policy that will encourage that. I've signed on and, and, I've, and I've pushed and promoted legislation that will address a lot of the H-2A and H-2B visa issues. I led the issue with a, of a representative out of New Hampshire for the J-1 visa program. I know it's important for the chamber. Talk to Ski Utah. They love the J-1 mm -hmm. visa issue. Um, that's been a very successful program for decades. And that got disrupted during COVID. And um, we're, we're leading the effort from our office to, to make sure that that gets you know, put back in place and, and we can see those numbers. I love going up to our ski resorts and, hey, you're from New Zealand. Awesome. You're from Argentina. Great. Mm -hmm. How are you liking it here? Then they have a positive interaction with Utah and there's good, there's good externalities that come from that when we, we go forward. Um, but workforce, where is it supposed to be addressed? In our education system and in our higher education mm -hmm. system. I think back to a, a luncheon, like a brown bag series that I did here at the chamber, I don't know, five or, five or so years ago. President Brad Mortensen from Weber State, mm -hmm. he came and explained the dual mission program that Weber State has, right? Where they are focused heavily on creating two really important things, which we may talk about as well as student debt, keeping students out of as much student debt as possible. And at the same time, creating a really strong job opportunity for them that they're going to be able to make a good strong wage and it's not only happening in our universities here in utah but it's happening in our tech centers so the ones that i represent davis tech ogden weber ub tech bridgerland those those organizations and, and in conjunction with our local leaders like our state legislature and our governor and focusing heavily on on um on promoting that type of education they're giving free tuition to high school juniors and seniors what does that do that gets them into a field they get a specific, a specific skill, and then if they choose to go on to a four-year degree, they're using that skill to work, create, they have, more, they have more job opportunities, and they're staying out of debt. And we're doing that here really, really well in, in Utah. So, And this, this next question flows right into what you're talking about, and that is the, the $20,000 in, in student debt forgiveness <laughs> that President Biden just announced. And I guess the policy question is, is, is forgiving student debt a good way to encourage others to attend college so that they can get into the workforce and find a good job. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't see that being the outcome that's going to come from this. Uh, if you saw my statement, you know that I was firmly against this. Uh, our, our entire federal delegation, our senators and our, our House members 
firmly against this, I could break it down into the three big reasons that I probably uh, I think are important for people to, to sort of grasp with this. Yeah, that'd be great. Is one, we're talking up to a trillion dollars worth of spending here, right? This could eventually cost a trillion dollars, right? And um, some of that spending took place already with providing those loans, but essentially it's, it, it's, it's estimated upwards to a trillion dollars. To that to go through executive authority, to go through executive action just by creating that type of policy from the White House, like that's fundamentally not how our, our government was established. That is, that is completely, you know, anti to how the founders established, you know, our three co-equal branches of government. And um, Congress has the purse strings. If it is such a popular policy that President Biden is claiming it is, he has both houses of Congress right now. It's a budgetary item. You could do these types of things on budget reconciliation when you have the majorities in both houses of Congress. Why didn't he go through Congress to try to enact something like this? Because I don't, I see enough Democrats being willing to say this is I'm, this is unfair. And that's my second point. It and this is what I'm hearing from constituents. Like, how is this fair? I just literally paid. I, we we just finished paying off you know our, my student debt, and now I'm not going to be able to take advantage. And somebody a few years behind me or something is now getting is now getting this benefit. Yeah, some people will benefit from it, but there's a there's a simple unfair element to this that is um, that's really going to erode our culture here. Um, parents are, and I think about it with my own kids. You know the concept of moral hazard, where it's like, listen, if, if the political political you know stars align and you have some debt good chance it's just gonna be wiped away for no reason other than a sort of campaign promise. And we can't build policy that way. And we can't go down that route. I think the last thing that I would highlight, um, this does nothing, and it's actually probably the most important thing, this does nothing to actually address the root cause of, of what's going on with rising costs. I highlight a lot of things that our universities are doing. I'm proud of to represent, you know, these, 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 what Utah is, is trying to focus on making sure kids stay out of debt as much as possible and have good, strong work going forward. Um, this doesn't incentivize um, universities to keep their costs down because if more and more money is available for these loans and you have a provision that doesn't get talked about, the 10 to 12, the 10 to 20,000 gets talked about a lot, but there is a provision that if, you know, you can only pay back anything over 30,000 at 5% cap of your salary, and anything that anything that exists in excess of that after 20 years gets wiped clean. Like that type of stuff is only going to encourage people to take out more loans so they can, you know, deal with the rising costs that are associated with college and tuition and books and housing and universities aren't incentivized to sort of do their part to keep these costs down. So addressing it in a way that isn't just handing it out as it's done and not addressing the root cause. Um, I would be really thrilled to be involved in anything that we can push forward to highlight some of the good that we're doing here in Utah and, and encourage other areas to do the same. Yeah, awesome, thank you. We're gonna to totally switch topics a little bit. Let's move into um, energy a little bit. Utah is mineral rich. We have copper, cobalt, lithium, and the um, International Energy Administration predicts that the, the demand for these minerals is going to be just grow exponentially. So how can federal policies help Utah emerge as a leader in these producer of minerals? And what does that look like? Yeah, glad we're talking about energy. I already jumped into it, so sorry <laughs> for, uh, for for it. And, you know, it's that important though. We could probably talk energy policy on almost any question. Um, so I, I talked a little bit about my consulting career and how it sort of gives me a little bit of a different perspective when you go back into a policymaking um, role. What we're missing completely from the Biden administration is what is the strategic plan? If um, electric vehicles and wind turbines and solar panels are the only thing that we can do, and they, they, they basically tried to move away from instead of what I would appreciate is a broader energy portfolio, incorporating nuclear, incorporating more hydro opportunities, um, incorporating uh, you know, lots of different types of renewables. You can go talk to Rocky Mountain you know, Power about what they're doing to, 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 to increase their percentage of their portfolio into renewables. Um, that's, that's the approach that we should be taking. Instead, we're sort of narrowing this down, saying this is gonna be the direction but we're not providing any real strategic plan on how to ultimately get there. How long does it take to go get an electric car? 
go down to one of the, the dealerships, it's going to be an, it's going to be yeah, a year. year at least. Yeah. So, okay, let's do a bill that provides all these tax incentives for something you can't even buy and something that's still powered by coal. Like there's no, there's no plan in place to be able to address it. Uh, I'll highlight an individual, a colleague of mine on natural resources. And I've, and I've, I've lumped into a, a ton of the work that he's been doing, um, from Minnesota. His name's Pete Stauber. And he has made this his, his key focus. And I love his passion for it because, you know, in Minnesota in particular, right? It's a state, there's very similar things that's going on. So as we, we talk, there are a whole effort in saying like, okay, if we're going to go this direction, we've got the right type of critical minerals. And you're also putting enormous amount of regulation and restrictions on what we can actually mine here in the U S and we have a huge gap on, you know, what you're trying, what we're trying to get to and what we can do with respect to the inputs into that. And what does that do? Increases our energy costs dramatically, which is what we've seen over time. There's a, there, there, there just isn't the plan. And so um, if there's a silver lining from the Inflation, Inflation Reduction Act that was just passed, it's that there's gonna be a requirement to use US-based manufacturing. I think they needed, in order to get Senator Manchin to come on board, they needed to, to create um, these provisions and requirements to use US-produced um, uh, mining. That is something that we'll focus on with respect to what Utah has available and what we're strong and the areas that we're strong and we'll, and we'll make sure that we're, we're, we're well represented there. Yeah, thank you, appreciate that. Okay, next topic is growth. And, and this is more state specific. And as you well know, we're, we are growing very rapidly. There are a lot of good things about that, but there are challenges that come along with that as well. Uh, so as we're talking about uh, what we can do to plan for the future, what do you see as measures that can be adopted to try to help mitigate the negative impacts of growth? In yeah. Um, we just met, the, the, the federal delegation just met with uh, at Governor Cox's invitation to, to talk about the, call, the, the Colorado River impact and the, um, or the compact mm -hmm. there and some of the, the, the fights that will, 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 will come up. We, we hope that they're not the fights. We hope they continue to stay in negotiations. We hope that they stay out of the courts. Uh, water's the, water's going to be a key, key factor here. And it's, uh, it's something that we have to be focused on, and it has to happen at every single level. Um, conservation efforts among consumers, how we make sure Utah gets its proper share and, you know, and all of the industries that require it and how we can, you know, best use it. And I, I'm really proud of the state legislature, our governor for, for putting the right amount of focus on this. Um, we've gotten a chance to lean in on, it's a bill called the Saline Lakes Ecosystems Act. For short, I call it the Great Salt Lake Bill. It just passed the house. Um, we sponsored it with a rep uh, the representative from California. It's part of those situations where what I'm trying to do back there is build relationships with people. So much of what gets done in Congress is building positive relationships. And I was able to do that in this case. It's an individual, it's a Democrat from Northern California, and um, he's got a saline lake or a terminal <laughs> lake in his district. Um, I showed him, I talked to him about what we're, what we're experiencing in the Great Salt Lake. This, the, the impetus to make this happen really came from a large advocacy group, um, state legislature, the governor, industry organizations, Ski Utah, all of these stakeholders. And our bill was able to get um, through the House, we're, we'll, we'll, Senator Romney's working on things as well. Um, he, he's kind of leading a lot of this from the, from the Senate side to provide a study, a U.S. geological survey that's gonna help provide some inputs and data into what our state legislator and the governor, the decisions they're making. I know they're focused on it and uh, it's, a, it's a key issue. So you already highlight the, the local part of it. And the other thing is, is uh, you know, growth gets directly into housing. Uh, housing, um, again, something that's dealt with appropriately and should be done at the, the local level. The way that we've interacted and been able to be a part of this, because I know it's such a, it is a huge, huge concern and need for, for folks. And if we have job growth and they can't find work, then we won't continue to have that type of job growth, um, is the transportation overlays. And we've, uh, I've appreciated like, you know, organizations like the Wasatch Front Regional Council, kind of the director of it that's headed up by Andrew Gruber, but one key factor in that and a great relationship. And he, he, we interact with him and his team frequently. But the, um, the best part about that organization is how much local presence they have on that. It's usually chaired by a mayor or a city councilman or a county commissioner. Um, and their focus is to how are we going to create the right type of transportation and infrastructure overlays. We get a chance on numerous occasions to help 
um, promote some of those, provide funding for some of these specific areas. They're, they, they can be as simple as um, you know, a traffic circle, a pavement pro, uh, pro project out in Manila, you know, a sewage, you know, a sewage project that, that, that the town desperately needs. And, and these are bite sized small, but really impactful situations um, that, that help out each local community. And we got a whole list of them on our website that we've got, gotten involved with. And it's a way that, that um, we've, we've been able to, to interact and that should help alleviate um, some of the housing issues. And then we can get into regulation if you'd like. <laughs> We, we have a lot, but more, the to chamber get, we always a lot good. more to get into. The chamber is yeah. always good to talk about regulation. Yeah, so. that, that is true. We do have views on that. Yeah, that's right. Well, my next question was on housing, so I'm going to skip over because I think you addressed it already. I want to talk about um, how it's imperative for individuals to have access to broadband. Mm -hmm. And we're really fortunate in the state of Utah. We have great broadband access, but there are gaps. There are holes. Morgan so, County. Yeah, yeah, Morgan, Morgan County. County. In my, exactly. In, my in the first district has a, is a, is a huge... It's, you know, I'm out, in, I'm out in the Uinta Basin, you know, two, three hours east, the eastern part of the state, much more rural, a lot farther away from the Wasatch Front, but Morgan County has, you know, certain issues. I know their local leaders are really focused on it. I talk to their county commissioners about it all the time. Um, yeah, so it's hard to take away from the question, no, but yeah, no, you're, you're just you're, to you're, you're, you are, you're, it's right off the Wasatch yeah. Front and it still has some issues, so there are gaps. Yeah, and so, and I don't think many people realize some of the gaps. So, what can be done to help Morgan County, the Daggett counties, the San Juan counties um, get connected? Yeah, well, um, I'll say that as I've talked to so Strata Networks out mm -hmm. in the basin, there's also another group called Union. Um, some of the things that they run into are, again, this fun little four letter word of NEPA regulation, mm -hmm. <laughs> designed with the, maybe the right intent. But as you try to embrace, you know, what, what, what can broadband ultimately do in our workforce? Well, it can create a, a diverse workforce that can live in various places across our state. That reduces some congestion here in the Wasatch Front. That might help, help, help air quality. So when you look at it, broadband is a positive thing. And if we can create, you know, people, it's how work is being done. Couldn't, I couldn't imagine my life without it. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't really do much um, in this day and age when it becomes the norm. So we need to make sure that we can get it to places. Sometimes the NEPA, NEPA regulation, you know, that is designed to create better environmental outcomes, gets in the way of actually being able to create the transmission lines, create the opportunity for that reach of broadband, and kind of stumble over ourselves. So, it, it, so that is a key big focus that, it, that, that we do on Natural Resources Committee, Energy and Commerce will be, um, will be part of it. Um, to, to get this to the proper smart regulatory environment mm -hmm. so the private sector can embrace it. Now, look, there's, there's crazy new ideas that I never thought I would be talking about, but you can get your broadband from space, mm -hmm. from, from uh, uh, the, not Tesla, but the Elon Musk's Musk, is, yeah, is, yeah. Is, is company that's doing a lot of the, the links that type of satellite stuff. That's, I mean, there's unique opportunities that, mm -hmm. that are going to kind of be a part of the new frontier in space. Uh, you, you, that, that will alleviate some of these rural areas um, if the cost can be kind of be um, available and, 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 and help folks. What other positives does it have? It's telehealth. One of the, one of the you know, a, a big cost savings in some of our, uh, in our healthcare world is to be able to um, embrace more telehealth opportunities. And particularly when you represent, you know, some more rural rural counties, those are really really important mm -hmm. because you know we don't always have to be in in person at some of these things as we've learned, kind of through the pandemic of what we can do and what type of technology we can embrace. Have we got time for one more? Yeah, I think we can do one more. Okay, yeah. depends this, on me probably. This, right? yeah. <laughs> be quick. Hey, we're we're be here quick. to listen I'll be quick. to you. I'll be brief. This is this has been fascinating, and the time's gotten way too fast. Yeah. Uh, so thanks again for being here. La last question is uh, sort of your elevator pitch as a candidate, and I know you do this all the time. You meet a new voter, somebody new to the district, and they come up and say hi and say, so why should I vote for you? Yeah. How do you respond to that question? Some of the things that I've heard from constituents is what they've appreciated is how much we're willing to listen, how much we're willing to um, also communicate what we're doing. I am sincerely trying to cut through a lot of the 
you know, the politics of it all and sp talk specific to, to policy. Um, I'm back there. I believe in strong conservative principles. Uh, I believe they're the best approach to things like fighting poverty and to improving our environment. And I'm trying to create a, uh, a credible voice that can, that can get to that. Um, we, we love communicating, even though they're tough sometimes, like going and doing those town halls and making sure people understand the context of which they may hear this or that about it. I will always show up regardless of however I vote, I will always show up and explain it. And I, what I've experienced over the last 20 months or so is that when folks have the context and they're, they're so willing to, to take in that communication and that's where we put a lot of our focus and we'll continue to do that. Thank you. And thank you so much for your support of the chamber. Yeah. We uh, really love having you as one of our allies. So thank you for being here today and for what you're doing for the chamber. Yeah. Thank you for your time today. And thank you to your team, the Salt Lake Chamber staff and Policy Impact Communications. And with that, have a great evening. Thank you both. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks.